Hello and welcome to Character Generation for Season 4. I am here at the table with Jenny and Andrea. And Andrea, you are the newest uh, cast member for yes. Season 4. Yes, yes I am. So, all right, have you played D&D before? Uh, a one-shot. A one-shot. Okay, good. So you're still relatively new. Mm -hmm. All right, and do you know what kind of character you want to make? A tiefling warlock. A tiefling warlock. Indeed. Yeah. That's good. Jenny and Jordan could use a little um, magical muscle on their side. Yeah. So um, how we're going to do character generation is this. You're going to roll four D6. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a note of all of those rolls. So I'll, I'll write down all your rolls. And you'll do six of those sets. Then you can go back. And any of the sets that have ones, you can re-roll the ones. So you take the best three but you can re-roll ones, mm -hmm. okay? Begin. Are you just gonna roll that die four times each time? Or are you gonna venture outside of your comfort zone and choose any of these other die? Do a little mix and match, maybe? Yeah, mm, I'll start with these. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's see what you get. Ooh, all right, all right. six, three, two, one. So don't re-roll that yet. At the end, let's see. Because you might have a bunch of sets where you might want to save that re-roll of a one for something else. Mm -hmm. Six, five, four, one. Wow. Jenny said that you have good rolls, but this is pretty good so far. <laughs> Uses gypsy magic. Yeah. Times of crisis. Four, four, one, one. See what I mean about saving that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we shall see. All right, keep going. You got three more. Wow. Six, five, three, three. Okay. Okay. Six, five, three, three again. Wow. Okay, <laughs> last set. Okay. <clears throat> wow. Six, six, five, four. Okay. So. Three of your sets have ones. There's this four four one one. Mm -hmm. In that case, you get to re-roll both of the ones. Okay. There's a six five four one, six three two one. Okay. The four four one one. Sure about that? I mean, these you already have. So look, six five four one. Yeah. So even if you don't roll, if you roll the two, that's still going to be a good good roll. Okay. Four four one one. Yeah, that's probably your call. Yeah. Because otherwise, that's going to be a harsh. Dump stat. That yeah. could be very average. All right, so you want to reroll the two one. ones on that? Wow. <laughs> what are the odds that you reroll ones? Okay, go ahead and reroll. Ah, okay. Reroll the one. So you got a five on one of them and a two. Ah, okay. okay, so that's now. All right, that's not bad. Four, yeah. four, five, two. Okay, so which of these other two are you going to reroll the one for? Mm -hmm. Six, five, four, one or six, three, two, one? Six, three, two, one. Okay, reroll a one. Ah. <laughs> you sure about that gypsy dice, buddy? Mm -hmm. You wanna try one of the good dice? Yeah, let me try those. May the power of Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> assist you. Okay, so now, taking the best of those, you have six, five, three. Mm -hmm. That's a 14. You have six, five, four. Mm -hmm. That's a 15. Pretty dang good so far. Five four four. That's a thirteen. Six five three. That's a fourteen. Six five three. That's a fourteen. Six six five is a seventeen. Mm. So you are highly above average. Oof. Seventeen fourteen fourteen thirteen fifteen fourteen. Mm -hmm. That's before any racial modifiers. Speaking of race, you want to make a tiefling warlock, Jenny? What's on the buffet buffet for that? <clears throat> Our tiefling warlock. So are we trying to figure out what? So is? tieflings get what for their their um, stat bonuses? This. Their stat bonuses. Your intelligence score increases by one. Mm -hmm. Your charisma score increases by two. Okay. All right. So. What do you want to put? Obviously, for warlocks, charisma is huge. Okay. You might. Some newer players might be like, yeah, put your highest thing in that and then get that up with the plus two. Mm -hmm. 
And that would, in fact, put you at a 19, but a 19 gives you the same ability score modifier as an 18. Mm -hmm. I... So, mm -hmm. would you instead consider... No, you know what? That's the right thing to do. All right. Because here's the thing. You're going to be starting off at level 6. So, at level 4, you get an ability score improvement, right? All classes get that. So at level four, with an ability score improvement, you can either take a plus two in one stat or plus one to two different stats. Mm -hmm. Ergo, maybe the smart move is to put 17 in there because that gets it to a 19 at first level. Mm -hmm. And then at fourth level, you throw a point into it. Now you're at a 20 charisma See what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, so let's say you're putting that 17 in your charisma. Mm -hmm. All right, so then it's going to be a 19, but actually, because we know that you're going to throw a point from your fourth level ability score improvement into it, just write down 20. So that's a plus 5 to your modifier, and your charisma is now 20. So that is used. Now, he still gets a plus <laughs> 1 to intelligence? Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Where do you want to put... What do you want to put in intelligence? Now, intelligence isn't necessarily intrinsically useful for warlocks, but it's useful to some of the proficiencies, mm -hmm. knowledge-based proficiencies. So you could put a 15 in there yeah. um, and make that a 16, which gives you a plus three to any skill checks involving knowledge. Mm -hmm. The other thing I should mention is a 15, as far as ability score modifiers, is the same as a 14. Oh, yeah. So if you put a 14 in dex, 14 in constitution, you're still going to get a nice fat plus two to those bonuses. All right. But with a plus one bonus to intelligence, mm -hmm. <clears throat> putting an odd number in there gets it up. So you'd get a 16 intelligence if you put the 15 in there. Or conversely, you put the 13 in there, that becomes a 14. Mm -hmm. And then you are truly the most above average man in the world. I'll go with the 15. Okay, so that becomes a 16 intelligence plus 3 modifier. Pow, used up. Now you got 14, 14, 14, 13. <laughs> By process of elimination, mm -hmm. you know that dexterity is important mm -hmm. because it affects your armor class and any missile ranged attacks. You know that um, constitution is mm -hmm. important because of hit points. Um, wisdom is very useful because of proficiencies like your passive perception, your, your perception, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, strength, not really that important for a tiefling warlock necessarily. Yeah. So. I'll go strength 13. Okay. And that is the equivalent of a plus one modifier, which leaves 14s in the rest of your stats, yeah. which is extremely solid, giving you a plus two modifier across the board to all of those other stats. All right. So, now the fun part. As we're making your tiefling warlock, so player name, um, your class and level is going to be warlock, and you're going to be level six. Mm -hmm. That's where you're starting in this campaign. Just jumping right ahead. Um, your proficiency <laughs> bonus is plus three. Yes. Which is going to have a huge impact. Your race is tiefling. Ah, there. So, Jenny, let's see what the buffet gives Andrea um, at first level as a warlock. So your hit die uh, is a d8, mm -hmm. plus your con modifier. In my game, I give my players, uh, for their characters, they get the maximum through level 5. So what that means is... Um, you have a plus two for your con bonus. Mm -hmm. So that means you have eight plus two is 10 hit points per level. So you're going to start off with 50 plus, now you're going to roll a D8. Mm -hmm. Pass him his dice. So you're going to roll a D8 and add in your con modifier, and this is your hit points for six level. So it's going to be this one. one. Okay. Thanks. Roll high. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Rip. Yeah. Um, so, 
you you can some DMs would make you take that. What I'll do is just have you take the average. I'll let you choose. So it's going to be five. Mm. So it's five plus two is seven. So that's fifty-seven. So your starting hit points, your max starting hit points here at six level is fifty-seven, oh. which is still amazingly good. Yeah. Okay. Currently. So. Um, flip over and go to your spell sheet real quick, just for a second. Oh. So your spell casting ability is charisma. <laughs> we'll just do all this stuff while we're in the area. <clears throat> your spell save DC is going to be eight plus your proficiency bonus plus your Charisma modifier. So you have a 16 for a spell save DC, oh, right? Because yeah. five for your Charisma, three for your Proficiency bonus. Mm -hmm. So that's eight plus eight is 16. Um, your spell attack modifier is plus eight. Mm -hmm. Your Proficiency plus your huge Charisma. Okay, so you're, you're pretty buff on the spell stuff. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Great. All right, um, cantrips. At sixth level, you know three cantrips. You can determine those later. Um, you have spells known, spells known seven. So you know seven total spells. Mm -hmm. Warlocks are a little different from some of the other spell classes. Um, so you're gonna have to pick out the seven spells that you know. Okay. Um, the thing is, is that you have a number of spell slots. Okay, so you have two spell slots mm -hmm. and three, you have up to third level slot levels. So you know six, wait, hold on. Sorry, you know seven spells. Mm -hmm. You have two spell slots and you have um, third level slots. Mm. But warlocks also regain their spells completely after a short rest. Most of the other uh, magic users have to do a long rest to regain their slots. You regain them after a short rest. All right. Um, <clears throat> then you also have invocations, and you also have um, some other components like your expanded spell list, which don't count against that. So we'll get into that in a minute. All right, flip back to your main character. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, let's go through the roster. Otherworldly patron. Have you figured out what you want to do for your patron? Or do you need some consultation? Mm, I might need some consultation. Okay. So the Archfey, out of the player's handbook, there, there are three basic ones. Mm -hmm. The Archfey, the Fiend, and the Great Old One. Um, and your, your patron has an impact on your expanded spell list. Okay, so like, let's yeah. look at the Archfey. Um, these are additional spells. They're added to the Warlock spell list for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, first level, Fairy Fire, and Sleep. So it's effectively like you know more spells. Mm -hmm. um, at second level, Calm Emotions, Phantasmal Force. At third level, Blink and Plant Growth. Fourth level, Dominate Beast, Greater Invisibility. But the patrons are more than just spells that you know. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, the patron thing is, it has a lot to do with kind of like how you role play your character. Because a warlock basically owes their magic to a pact that they made with a patron. Yeah. Okay, so the Archfey basically means that you're somehow affiliated with uh, your patron or, or is a lady or lord of the Fey, right? Mm. Um, so that would kind of factor into your role playing as well. Um, you get some cool abilities as well. Um, so like at first level, you have Fey Presence. Your patron bestows upon you the ability to project the beguiling and fearsome presence of the Fey. Mm -hmm. You have Misty Escape at sixth level, which is where you're starting. You can vanish in a puff of mist in response to harm. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to turn invisible and teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. You remain invisible until the start of your next turn, mm -hmm. or until you attack or cast a spell. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. That takes you up to 6th level through the Archfey. Alright, mm -hmm. then you have the Fiend, 
which is basically like you made a deal with a de uh, devil or a demon. Uh. <laughs> um, in my original world, it would have a slightly different connotation, but same basic thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, just because the patron that you make a deal with is evil doesn't mean your character is evil. And a lot of beginning players mix that up. Mm -hmm. They think that if they do the Pact of the Fiend that they should be evil. They might be evil. <laughs> um, or they have to be evil. That's not true. Um, you could be a character who's conflicted. You could be good and have a pact with somebody evil. You know, you made a pact in a moment of weakness in a quest for power, and now you have this internal struggle within your character. Mm -hmm. um, you could be somebody who's neutral, who just sought the power and took it where they had the option to take it. Um, so let's take a look at the fiend. So the expanded spell list for the fiend includes a lot of things that you would think of with fiend mag magic, like burning hands, command, blindness, deafness, scorching ray, fireball, stinking cloud, fire shield, wall of fire, flame strike, and hallow. Ah. Those are some dope spells to have in your back pocket, not going to lie. Yeah. Um, let's look at the um, special um, benefits of uh, being a subservient one. The Dark One's Blessing. Uh, starting at first level, when you reduce a hostile creature to zero hit points, you gain temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier plus your warlock level. All right. So it's almost like a weird vampiric element where, you know, you, you take somebody down and you gain hit points from taking them down. Oh. Dark One's own luck. At sixth level, you can call on your patron to alter fate in your favor. When you make an ability check or a saving throw, you can use this feature to add a d10 to your roll. You can do so after seeing the initial roll, but before any of the roll's effects occur. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Hmm. Also, not bad. Yeah. Then there's the Great Old One. <clears throat> the idea of the Great Old One is, you know, something otherworldly, almost alien even, Cthulhu-ish. Oh. There's some <laughs> kind of, you know, elder thing. Again, not necessarily evil. These might even just be intrinsically neutral. Yeah. But, um, so the spell list gives you a lot of things that other spellcasters wouldn't necessarily have access to. Um, some of these are bard type things. Um, so it's kind of cool because it expands beyond the normal warlock list. Mm. Dissonant Whispers, Tasha's Hideous Laugh, Detect Thoughts, Phantasmal Force, Clairvoyance, Sending... Dominate Beast, Everard's Black Tentacles, Dominate Person, Telekinesis. So a lot of the Great Old One spell list stuff is things that, think of them as like things that mess with people's mind. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Bordering on insanity because your patron <laughs> is so otherworldly that people's sanity crumbles at the very thought of their power. Now, I personally, my best highest level character in D&D was a warlock, got him up to 17th level, and we did a variation on the Great Old One. One of the greatest elements is the simplest. At first level, you have awakened mind. You can communicate telepathically with any creature you can see within 30 feet of you. You don't need to share a language, but the creature must be able to understand at least one language. You'll notice that nowhere in that description does it say you can do this one and then you have to once and then have to have a short rest. You can do this all the time. Ooh. The ability to communicate telepathically all the time is extremely game-breakingly powerful, and it's wonderful and lovely. Um, then at sixth level, because you're starting at sixth level, check this out. Entropic Ward. Mm -hmm. You learn to magically ward yourself against attack and to turn an enemy's failed strike into good luck for yourself. When a creature makes an attack roll against you, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on that roll. If the attack misses you, your next attack roll against the creature has advantage if you make it before the end of your next turn. Once you use this, you have to blah, 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 short rest or long rest. Entropic Ward is supremely dope. Mm -hmm. Basically, like, imagine somebody's going to hit you hardcore. You can use your reaction to put disadvantage on that roll. That's cool. Say it's a really badass monster that everybody's having a hard time killing. Mm -hmm. That's when you pull Entropic Ward out of your back pocket. You put disadvantage on that monster, and then if they miss you, you get advantage on that monster on your next attack, which is 
Super cool. <laughs> now, not to look too far ahead, but 10th level, Thought Shield. <laughs> Starting at 10th level, your thoughts can't be read by telepathy or other means unless you allow it. You also have resistance to psychic damage. That means you take half damage. Whenever a creature deals psychic damage to you, that creature takes the same amount of damage that you do. That's pretty cool. Notice that you just get that. It's not like, it's like, a, not like a use it once and then short rest. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> pick what you want. I swear, honestly, like I don't have a personal investment, but I feel like you should know that the great old one thing is cool too. Now, I'm also not going to rush you because off camera, there are a plethora of other warlock patrons and options. Mm -hmm. um, one of which is called the Hexblade. So if you want to make more of a combat oriented uh, warlock, that's an option. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I would be remiss in my duties as your DM if I told you that these were your only options. But I want you to weigh and think about those. All right. Okay, another thing that warlocks get, because you probably noticed that you're like, you don't get a lot of spells in spell slots, Yeah. but they get all these other cool things, okay? So Eldritch Invocations. <clears throat> these are lovely, lovely, lovely powers that give you more power mm -hmm. and different power than any other spellcaster, okay? So at second level, you would get your Eldritch Invocations. Um, and by the way, as you gain levels, there's other things. At third level, you get a Pact Boon. At sixth level, you get to pick another otherworldly patron feature. Well, you don't pick it, but you get it, <laughs> right? So we let read through the ones that you get at sixth level. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to the um, invocations, okay? So over these next few pages are the invocations that come in the player's handbook that are related to the three options that they present. Mm -hmm. There are, like I said, other patrons with benefits and other invocations in other books that you can look at. But, yeah. so Eldritch Blast is probably the cantrip of choice for every warlock. Basically, it's a spell that warlocks can cast. At higher levels, you could split the beams and either damage, you know, send like two beams at one person or two beams at two different people mm -hmm. in the same round. It's a cantrip, which means you can cast it every round as much as you want. You never have to, like other like your other spells, it doesn't burn up a slot. Oh. And it does a huge, tremendous amount of damage. It does 1d10 damage. But wait, there's more. One of the greatest Eldritch Invocations, and it's quite simple, is Agonizing Blast. When you cast Eldritch Blast, add your Charisma modifier to the damage it deals on a hit. Okay? Mm -hmm. So a normal Warlock, without that, would get, oh, I just did four. You would do nine. Do you smell what I'm cooking now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now imagine, okay, because, I mean, that's huge. Well, yeah. let's read through. Jenny, why don't you go ahead and read through. Armor of Shadows, just start at the next column. Armor of Shadows, you can cast Mage Armor on yourself at will without expending a spell slot or material components. So you know what that means, right? Yeah. Mage Armor basically gives you the equivalent of, like, a 13 AC. You could be just be wearing clothes. You might not choose to do that. You might just be like, I'm cool with my, you know, you have a good dexterity. You got a 14 dex. Mm -hmm. So keep reading. Skip the ones that say like ninth level because he's not there yet. Yeah. Beast speech. You can speak with animals at will without expending a spell slot. Mm -hmm. Beguiling influence. You gain proficiency in the deception and persuasion skills. Oh. Now... Low-key, that's kind of cool at first. It seems cool, but it's sort of a waste of an invocation. Because if you wanted those skills, you could take a background mm -hmm. that has those kind of skills. So, continue. Um, ooh. Maybe do Book of the Ancient Secrets? Skip that for now. Go to Devil's Sight. Devil's Sight. Mm -hmm. You can see normally in darkness, both magical and non-magical, to a distance of 120 feet. So normally, like races that can see in darkness have a 60 foot range. Mm -hmm. And most of those can't see in magical darkness. Like when somebody casts the darkness spell, yeah. everybody's just blind. <laughs> but not you, devil's yeah. sight. All right, keep going. Eldritch sight. 
You can cast Detect Magic at will without expending a spell slot. I, <clears throat> let me just take a deep breath. That's super crazy powerful. Detect Magic is a, an amazing spell. It's like a basic go-to spell for every spellcaster. Mm -hmm. You can cast it whenever you want. Like, you don't have to regain slots. That just is a thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going. Eldritch Spear. When you cast Eldritch Blast, its range is 300 feet. So just to give you an idea, another reason why I like Eldritch Blast is just even normally, you have a range of 120 feet. That's like a longbow. Yeah. Like, you could shoot, <laughs> shoot, like, you know, that's that's a, a hike, man. Um, and what I was saying before about the beams, you get two beams at fifth level. So you're sixth level, which means every round you can cast two Eldritch Blasts. So if you hit with them, you're rolling damage. You know, that for you would be an 11, and that would be a 12. So you just did 23 damage on one opponent, or 11 on one, 12 on another, mm -hmm. at a range of 120 feet. With Eldritch Spear, it goes out to 300 feet, which is like sniper level. <laughs> like you could be, 300 feet's a football field away, and you can accurately hit people. Okay, keep going. Eyes of the Rune Keeper. You can read <clears throat> all writing. Okay, so give, I'll give you a real example that just happened. Um, Beecher's character, when he gained a level, picked Eyes of the Rune Keeper and basically broke my game. Because he could read a language, an ancient dead language, mm -hmm. that nobody else could read. And he deciphered like huge clues. So that's kind of cool. Keep going. Fiendish Vigor. You can cast False Life on yourself at will as a first level spell without expending a spell slot or material components. Now you might be like, um, that's kind of lame. So it depends on how you use it, like anything. Um, false life basically gives you 1d4 plus 4 temporary hit points for up to an hour. It's not quite a healing spell. Mm. But it gives you, like if you're you know, in a pinch and you need help, it's like an emergency backup system. All right. Gaze of two minds. You can use your action to touch a willing humanoid and perceive through its senses until the end of your next turn. As long as the creature is on the same plane of existence as you, you can use your action on subsequent turns to maintain this connection. Extending the duration until the end of your next turn. While perceiving through the other creature's senses, you benefit from any special senses possessed by that creature, and you are blinded and deafened to your own surroundings. You get what that means? Yeah. Yeah, it's like like friendly possession. Friendly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mask of Many Faces, you can cast Disguise Self at will without expending a spell slot. Do you watch Game of Thrones? Uh, no. Okay. So in Game of Thrones, there's this group called the Faceless Men. They're basically assassins, uh -huh. and they can appear to be anyone with some kind of magical skin mask of some sort. Uh -huh. You can just do that. That's pretty sick. Yes. Um... A lot of these other ones are higher level. Mm -hmm. Misty Visions. Yeah, Meyer the Mind, you can cast Slow once using a Warlock spell slot. Um, slow is a much, you know, it's a pretty powerful spell. Mm -hmm. Misty Visions, you can cast Silent Image at will. Um, one with Shadows. When you are in an area of dim light or darkness, you can use your action to become invisible until you move or take an action or a reaction. Um... Do you see anything about you can only do that and then you have to do a short rest or long rest afterwards? Because I don't. No. Nope. How did I miss that? Dang. Oh, wait a minute. You can use your action to become invisible until you move or take an action. So it's not really that great. I thought, like, you can just turn invisible <laughs> in the shadows. I was like, yeah. that's super powered. <laughs> yeah. Okay, not that great. Mm. Repelling Blast, that's part of the Eldritch Blast family. Um, that basically allows you to make your Eldritch Blast into a push attack that pushes people 10 feet away. That's okay. Whoa. Sign of Ill Omen. You can cast Bestow Curse once using a spell, Warlock spell slot. Thief of Five Fates. You can cast Bane once using a Warlock spell slot. So there are some things where you have to burn a slot to use it, and those things are usually cool. I tend to gravitate towards like invocations that just let me do things all the time. Mm -hmm. without costing anything. Yeah. 
because that's handy. Voice of the Chainmaster. So that's the one that Beecher took. And that goes back to the whole like pack to the chain thing. So if you have a familiar, normally with a familiar, you have some ability to communicate with it. This is like super powered, okay? You can communicate telepathically with your familiar and perceive through your familiar's senses as long as you are on the same plane of existence. So it's kind of like that gaze of the two minds thing. Mm -hmm. Additionally, while perceiving through your familiar senses, you can also speak through your familiar in your own voice, even if your familiar is normally incapable of speech. Mm -hmm. That is not included in Gaze of Two Minds. So that's, that's pretty dope. Pretty good. So those are all some options for you to consider, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Let's backtrack, shall we? So those are the Eldritch Invocations. You're going to want to pick out um, the invocations that you would get. Um, and, but also you have a Pact Boon at third level. You get to pick the Pact Boon. Mm. Okay, so Pact of the Chain is the one with the familiar thing, right? You learn the Find Familiar spell and can cast it as a ritual. The spell doesn't count against your number of spells known, so it's like a bonus. When you cast it, you can choose one of the normal forms or one of the following special forms, Imp, Pseudo-Dragon, Quasit, or Sprite. Mm. Additionally, when you take the attack action, you can forego one of your own attacks to allow your familiar to make one attack of its own. Then we have Pact of the Blade. You can use your action to create a packed weapon in your empty hand. It's like a ghost sword, basically. Like, mm. you can choose the form that this melee weapon takes each time you create it. You're proficient with it while you wield it, and this weapon counts as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. Mm. Your packed weapon disappears if it is more than five feet away from you for one minute or more. It also disappears if you use this feature again if you dismiss it. You can transform one magic weapon into your packed weapon by performing a special ritual while you hold the weapon. You perform the ritual over the course of one hour, which can be done during a short rest. You can then dismiss the weapon, shunting it into an extra dimensional space, and it appears whenever you create your own packed weapon after. So it's basically like a portable magic weapon that you can make appear or yeah. disappear whenever you want. Which again, sounds cool, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But I think about it critically and I'm like, what weapon is a 13 strength warlock gonna really be able to take advantage of? Yeah. Or even a dexterity based weapon. You know, if you use a finesse weapon like a rapier, mm -hmm. okay, that's 1d8 damage. But your Eldritch Blasts do 1d10 plus five. Yeah. So I'm just saying. <laughs> then we have Pact of the Tome, which this one I actually took for my guy. Huh. Your patron gives you a grimoire called a Book of Shadows. When you gain this feature, choose three cantrips from any class's spell list. That's huge. While the book is on your person, you can cast those cantrips at will. They don't count against your number of cantrips known. So in other words, you know your warlock cantrips plus three more. Ooh. But wait, there's more. If you lose your Book of Shadows, you can perform a one-hour ceremony to receive a replacement from your patron. The ceremony can be performed during a short or long rest, and it destroys the previous book. The book turns to ash when you die. So the Pact of the Tome is cool because, unlike all the other spell um, spellcaster classes, you can actually access spells from other classes. Hmm. Now, here's what we're going to do at this point. You have written down your ability scores. Yes. I'm gonna, we're going to hold off. On finishing your character because you need to take some time to read through this stuff to yeah. look through the options and to make a decision about your patron and which packs you want to do and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and also to think about the spells but just just so people know where you're going okay as a warlock you have um, the ability to choose two skills from the following list. Arcana, Deception, History, Intimidation, Investigation, Nature, and Religion. Mm. The other component about 5th edition D&D &D, though is that you have backgrounds. And backgrounds are basically like kind of who your character was or where he came from, mm -hmm. okay? And those backgrounds all grant different abilities and stuff. So what I like to encourage people to do is look through the background section and find a background that fits your idea for your character. All right. You may think of your character as being like, you know, a really nice guy who's a wandering folk hero or a criminal 
or maybe an acolyte. Now, you know, people look at acolytes and they're like, oh, you worked in a temple? Woohoo. Maybe it was a satanic temple. I don't not say, you know what I mean? But yeah. maybe it was like the temple that your patron, you know, where your patron is worshipped. So there are ways to tie in all these different things. Um, guild artisan. You're a member of an artisan's guild, skilled in a particular field and closely associated with other artisans. So that's like calligraphers, carpenters, cobblers, cooks, glass blowers, jewelers, alchemists. That might not seem intrinsically cool, right? Yeah. Unless maybe you came up with your own thing that was mega cool. Like um, a bone smith. You know, you make jewelry out of bones. See how badass that just turned just yeah. by using bones? Or like skulls. I don't know. You know what I mean? So like there are a lot of different ways that you could you could take a background and, and make it your own and make it part of this character. So what you're going to do off camera <clears throat> is look at the backgrounds, look at the patrons, look at the Eldritch Invocations and the Pact Boons, and then we're going to finish your character off camera. Mm -hmm. And so the next time you guys see Andrea, you will see him at the table for the first episode of Season 4. So, um, yep, that's your homework assignment. Jenny's right. here to help you. There's a player's yes. handbook, courtesy of all of our fans. So thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you very soon. <laughs>